Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Greg Coates. I'm usually in the back running sound. So if you don't see me out in the seats, that's the reason why. I, see, I know everybody by the back of their heads. I can tell you where you sit, first service or second service, by the back of your head. So uh, it uh, kind of is one of those situations. I can tell you most usually where, you know, what service people come to, that type of thing. And uh, it, it makes it fun. Um, when I was asked to do this class, Last week, I sat down and I was sitting there thinking, what leader in the Old Testament should I pick? There's so many. But I wanted to pick one that most people may not think of right off the top of their head as being a leader, but was very impactful. So we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at Isaiah. Now, when you ask a businessman to put together a leadership or a leader's piece, you know, a class, you're going to get leadership principles. And how can they apply to our Christian daily walk? Well, I'm borrowing a lot of things from John Maxwell, okay? Um, it's... Uh, He's got some great study guides and some great things, but I just wanted to kind of bring those two together. Um, when we think of Isaiah, there are some things that, you know, the impact that Isaiah had, not just on the Old Testament, but also on the New Testament. He was the foremost authority in the New Testament when it came to the Messiah. The Jewish leaders, when it came to the Messiah, every time they would turn to the book of Isaiah. He became something, someone who they looked up to and that was read quite often throughout services and so on and so forth. So that's what we want to take a look at today I am kind of one of those historical buffs. I like to know when things happened. So if you could bring up the timeline, you'll see there in the red, uh, that's Isaiah's life. Okay? He's in the same time frame as Hosea, Isaiah, uh, Micaiah, uh, Micaiah, Amos, uh, kind of right at the end of Amos's life. But then you see way down about 100 years later, you see Daniel. And you see Jeremiah, who is 75 years after, after Isaiah. So my mind starts thinking, hmm, did they have the writings of Isaiah to encourage them in God? Did they, did they know of the things that he had prophesied? Was, was that part of their daily life and their upbringing? I'm one of these historical buffs in such a way that, so for one year, I'll read through the Bible in the NIV. The next year, I'll read it through in the ESV. The next year... I'll read it through uh, in what's called the Jewish Complete Bible. And then the, the fourth year, I read it through in the Chronological Bible. So I get to see where everybody starts overlapping one another and the different prophets and intermingling. And then you get to the New Testament and you get all the stories that the four Gospels get put together. And then you're reading Acts and you see where Paul's epistles get written when he's in jail or captive somewhere or whatever the case might be. It just kind of helps me relate the Bible historically. 
And so that's why looking at some of these things, it just kind of helps me understand where they fall. Well, one of the first things that we want to look at in Isaiah's life is Isaiah 6 and his encounter with God. If you look at the first five books of the first five books of Isaiah, or chapters, excuse me, you will find Isaiah was really, really good at pointing out everybody else's faults. He liked to sit down and just rip them, and, and he loved it knowing that they were going to get theirs. Now, I don't know about any of you, but sometimes I fall into that same category. You know, oh, they're finally going to get their due. And then Isaiah has his encounter in chapter 6. And so I'm going to read this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphims, each had six wings. With two they covered his face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. The foundations on the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one seraphim flew to me, and having in his hand a burning coal that he had in his, with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. There's something really interesting in this. It starts out by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died. Okay? Looking at this, Isaiah was born in, 19, in 742 B.C. King Uzziah died in 733. How old was he? How old? Yeah. He was, he, so King Uzziah died in, in 733. He was born in 742. He was nine years old. He was nine years old when he had this encounter with God. I've been on a mission trip to, to the Ukraine and we sat down and we were trying to share with the Ukrainians who still have the old Russian mindset that kids should not be ministered to. And we were teaching this church and, and these people and pastors on how kids are just as important. And this brings it out right here. God used a nine-year-old. He touched a nine-year-old and therefore changed his life. If it was not for this portion of Scripture, we would not see many of what, take, what, of what took, takes place later on, at least in Isaiah's name. So let's take a look. Responding to the divine call. There are five levels of leadership in, in a response to the call. First is a revelation of God. Isaiah's encounter with God's with God face to face changed him and his message. 
It changed him and his message. You cannot go and be touched by God and not have your life changed. You also can't go and having had your life changed, not change your message. It's going to affect you. Now, if you do, you didn't allow God really to touch you or you didn't allow him to impact your life. The realization of God's holiness, step two. As Isaiah experienced God's holiness, God became more than an abstract idea. He became more than his mom and dad's God. He became more than just a supreme leader. He became personal. His encounter reached beyond knowledge. God became personal and Isaiah learned of his awesome personality. Think back to the first time you had an encounter with God. Not just one where you felt guilty, but where God just kind of really pierced your life. I can remember laying on a college prayer room floor and having that experience. And it changed me, not just the way I looked at things, the way I looked at myself, the way I looked at other people. It made a difference in who I was. Stage three is a recognition of his own sinfulness. Isaiah experienced firsthand the disparity between him and God. And it's a big disparity. A huge gap. With this, he started to understand the infinite contrast and the brokenness of his own life. Stage four, the renewal of his precepts. It is with this, the touch from the angel, that Isaiah was cleansed and received a new outlook. Not just the outlook on himself, but the outlook on others. When I was in Bible college, I had a job, or short, you know, with when I was telling you the experience of me on the, laying on the prayer room floor, my job at that time was to be a night watchman or night guard at an emergency housing shelter in downtown Minneapolis. Um, it was rather rough. It was rather dangerous. I wasn't allowed to carry a gun, a nightstick. I wasn't allowed to carry any type of weapon whatsoever. And they just said, fend for yourself, good luck. But the way I looked at the residents there totally changed. It wasn't, oh, look at those dirty people. It was, oh, what happened to them? I wanted to know their story. Not that I would have pity on them, but that I could help understand and pray better for them. Our outlook needs to sometimes be revised and, re and renewed Response to his lifestyle is stage five. After this encounter, the prophet Isaiah was eager to step forward and serve God at his calling. A call marked by a changed, changed and fruitful life. A lot of times we hear God calling or asking us to do something. But do we do it? 
do we respond? Without our own encounter with God, we will not experience whom he is, who we are in him, and the change that so we so desperately need to take place in each of our lives. When I was in Bible school at North Central in Minneapolis, I took, I took a class on the book of Isaiah. And one of the final questions, the final question on the final exam was, what part of the book of Isaiah impacted you the most? And many of the students wrote about different prophecies that Isaiah made later on in the book, but I wrote about this one. Because without this one, we wouldn't have the book of Isaiah. It may have been somebody else. Without these 12 verses here in chapter 6, that change that took place in his life, we may not have a book of Isaiah. It may have been named something else because God would have gone and found someone else, touched their lives, and he still would have gotten his message across. But he wanted to use Isaiah, and he responded. So I have some questions for you. Have you had an encounter with God lately? Is he looking to use you and are you available? He may be wanting to use, to use you as a leader in your home, in your neighborhood, at work. But are we ready? Isaiah had many encounters with God as you can read throughout the book of Isaiah, you'll see where God, it, God came to Isaiah. It wasn't a one and done deal. We need to have those encounters daily. Maybe not to this extent, but we gotta have that personal encounter with God every single day. Because if we don't, we won't be able to really impact those around us. Has anybody got any questions or anything they want to add? I hate being one of those professors that, or teachers that stand up here and do all the talking. So, does anybody want to? No? Yes. Sorry, excuse me. Um, can I have a question? Is how do you know his God calling you? How do you know God calling you? Is that is that the question? Yes. Okay. How do you know God calling you? Well, let me ask, let me just say it this way. When God touched your life and you gave your heart to God, right? Was God calling you then? Was he pulling on your heart to become a child of God? Yes. yes. Okay. That's your calling, to be a child of God. Now, what you do with that afterwards, every, not everybody has a calling to be a teacher. Not everyone has a calling to be a pastor. Not everyone has a calling to stand up here and sing every Sunday morning. But we're called to serve him. We're called to lead. And when he opens the doors for us to step through, whether it's at work, at home, in our neighborhoods, that's still our calling. Our calling is to serve him. Now, Pastor Sean, <laughs> I, got, I just got to get approval here, you know. It is. You're doing great. No, I, I think 
practically the same way you sense God calling you into salvation, and you're familiar with his voice and how he began to speak to you, you'll be familiar. It's that same familiar voice that invites you into every next piece of your life, and you'll begin to be familiar with that voice and understand his calling. Uh, Pastor Benson always said, look in your hands and look in your heart. You know, what are the natural giftings and abilities and passions that God has put in your heart to do in this life? And most of the time, those things are wrapped up in your calling, and they're assigned to what God's inviting you to do with them. Yep. I think God, God calls us all. And I think, you know, the Bible's very clear. It says he called all of us to go and make disciples. So you've been called. And the Bible also says that we cannot come to an understanding of God unless God calls them unto him. So you've been called. I think, I think we try to complicate it because we want to hear some voice that tells us tomorrow at 8 a.m. I need you to go talk to so-and-so. That may happen, it may not, but you got to read God's word. He already spoke to you on his word, but people want to hear an audible voice. People want to hear a lot of different things as opposed to getting God's word out that he already published for us, but we don't want to go read it because that requires effort and work and we just want to hear a voice that tells us do this he has called us to be good people he has called us to stand for mercy and justice he has called us to be good moms and dads and wives and husbands and friends he has called us to be all that we can be for his honor and glory we're his ambassadors so we're all called and it's it's literally that simple at least in my mind you know all right Yep. You know, a call to serve is just that, to serve. And whether it is in front of a large group of people or whether it's serving one person, it's still serving, and we're serving God. Okay? Next, we're going to take a look at Isaiah 15, 5, and then chapter 6, 9, and 11. And because of time, we're not going to read these, but it is going to be up on the screen, and it's, I believe it's in your notes as well. But a leader's heart of love for the unlovely. Ooh, now we're meddling. <laughs> Loving the unlovely. Okay. A godly leader does not want the judgment to come on the people. He actually grieves over them. Now, I know what grief is. I mean, we, we've all heard it. So we've lost someone. We understand what grief is that way. But I had to go find, I had to go look it up. You know, just my own curiosity and one of the synonyms for grief is anguish. Anguish. And when I think of anguish, I think of a gut-wrenching, heart-ripped-out emotion. And I got to do that for the unlovely? When is the last time that we grieved over our home, over our neighborhood, over our coworkers? This hit home to me when I was putting this together more than you will ever know. 
I have a co-worker that I am one of those. I would, I would be like Isaiah in the first five chapters. Get them. Get them. Let them be fired. He's no longer, he would no longer be my headache. And as I'm reading this, God just kind of slapped me in the face several times and said, what are you talking about? And I had to change. I had to repent. I had to change. It, my encounter with him today was different than my encounter with him yesterday because of the difference. The anguish of grieving for him and his situation And all I could pray every day is, Lord, help me grieve for the unlovely. Help me grieve for those that might wrong me. Help me understand a little bit more what it is that where they're at. And may I be empathetic and sympathetic to them rather than outraged. Even though they might deserve the judgment, Isaiah knew that without God's grace and mercy, no one can expect anything else. When's the last time we prayed grace and mercy over the unlovely, over the people that have wronged us, over the, the next door neighbor who's playing the music too loud and the baby's awake. I remember those days. <laughs> When's the last time we prayed over that coworker that just rubs us the wrong way? To grieve for them, to ask for grace and mercy, to fall on them from God, but also grace and mercy in our life that we can apply it to them. Because I'll tell you what, I might be able to apply grace and mercy to my wife and kids, especially my grandkids. I mean, they can do no wrong. <laughs> oh, that's it. They can't. They're perfect. <laughs> but you know, it's a whole nother story to apply grace and mercy to someone else, especially outside of that circle that we hold so close and dear. We need to be able to do that. And we can't do that without God pouring in the grace and mercy into our lives. As a children's pastor, I did an illustration and I forgot, it just came to my mind so I don't have the, the tools to do it. But I would take a cup and you know you pour water into the cup and you know how you can get the water just over the top of the cup and it just sits there and it's just perfect before the next drop comes over the edge? That cup is us. The water in the cup is God. And when we pour another drop in and we start, or we start tipping the glass over and pick and spilling out some of the water, all of a sudden we get drained down in ourselves. There was an old song that we used to sing, especially way back when and when I was a kid. Fill my cup, Lord, fill it up till I want no more. And I got thinking of that song and I said, heaven forbid that we ever say that I want no more of God. 
What needs to happen is that pitcher needs to keep pouring into that glass and what pours out of that glass and spills over on, onto the table or onto others, that's that grace and mercy spilling out of our lives onto them. We can't just stop at the top and then pour out one little bit at a time because we'll find ourselves empty really quick. We need to keep having it poured into us. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say or add until we, before we move on to the next one? <laughs> Here, hang on. I always tell my kids whenever they're having a hard time, either at school or with their dad, um, I always tell them, just pray. Pray for them. They're not having a good day. Just pray for them and ask the Lord to help them and to guide them. And but yeah, but I'm so mad. I want to just pray. Just pray about it. I know it's hard and I know it get, goes against you, but just pray. They just need God. You know, it's really hard to be mad at somebody when you're praying for them. <laughs> Sometimes you have to pray for yourself, yes? But you know, when you're praying for someone else, earnestly praying for them, not just, God, get them. Because <laughs> that, that, that's still a prayer. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that comes out of my mouth. Needs to be more God, get me to help me touch them. Because I might be the answer that they need that day to change their outlook on what's going on in their life. One, one thing you look at, if you think of a godly leader grieving over the people, Moses was willing to die for the people. Now that's love. That's an incredible love, and he typifies Christ, right? But Moses was willing to, God, kill me instead of them. So he stood in the gap. The other one, deserve judgment. I think of Jonah. He didn't want to go preach in Nivea, Nivea because he didn't want them to repent because he was very mad at them because of what they had done. You know, they, they, they warred against them. They beat them, etc. So he didn't want them to ever have grace. That's why he refused to go. He ended up going, but he's like, well, they might just repent. And they did. <laughs> yeah. But even afterwards, he was still mad that they did repent, <laughs> you know, Come on now. So next, we want to take a look at Isaiah chapter 25, 1 through 5, or 1 through 12, which is the vision of great leaders never lose sight of the big picture. Have you ever, have you ever known somebody to be very narrow-minded and this is what they do because this is what they know and they never want to step outside of that. The difference between followers and leaders. We see in these verses that Isaiah is praising God in chapter 25 for the future. However, if you look back into chapter 24, we see that it is the gloom and doom of the immediate situation, of their sin, of the wrath that God is going to have on them because of their situation. As leaders, we must stay in touch with both, not only the present, but also the future. We must look beyond what is going on immediately around us and see what's ahead of us. So let's take a look at the difference between followers and leaders. Followers see the here and now. Leaders see the ultimate goal and potential. Wait a minute. 
potential. Do you know that person that's rubbing you the wrong way has potential? When's the last time we went looking for it? When's the last time we sat down and said, you know, what's an area that they do really well at instead of picking on them for the things they do wrong? What's something that they do well at that we can help bring that potential out of them? We look for potential and we help grow it. Followers are driven by the atmosphere of today. Whatever the flavor of the day is, if, every, if one person is mad, the whole group is mad. If one person is happy, everybody seems to be joyful and, and giddy and gung-ho. But if you listen around what we used to call the water cooler, in other words, now it's the coffee pot, if you listen around the coffee pot and you start hearing people nitpick about one thing or another, you'll, you'll hear others doing the exact same thing. And it spreads like wildfire. We need to be the influencers to change that. Leaders are driven by their future vision for tomorrow. What's the bigger picture? Oh, yeah, it may not be going right today. We may have 26 planes sitting on a tarmac waiting for parts. And believe me, that's huge in my industry. There's people yelling, and they're yelling from the top down. But to the next day, we not only have those 26 back, in, back flying, but maybe we only, you know, we've taken care of several other things that would have caused even more delays later on. It's looking at the big picture, not just what is immediately in front of us. Followers have limited perspective on their abilities. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I'm not old enough. Or as my little grandson says, I'm not big enough. But it's their abilities, what they see at the moment. The larger perspective, for leaders, the larger perspective on everyone's abilities. Everyone in the group. Not just looking at one person, but looking at the whole group. Today I had uh, someone who I had shown some tools that to help them do their job better. And I had another person in our group that didn't know anything about these tools. I had just shown person A the tools. They hadn't really used them yet. But I'm, I told person A, they're going to teach person B how to use them. I'll sit there with them, but it'll help reinforce to person A what's going on, in it, but it gives everybody the, the ability to use it. We got to look past just the small picture, but we got to look at everyone's abilities and how they fit together. The family, the body, all those images that we see throughout the Bible. Followers can be distracted by today's losses, but leaders stay on track by focusing on the goals. For followers, the key word is immediate. For leaders, the key word is the ultimate. How do we apply these today? Well, our ultimate goal, heaven. Life with Christ for eternity. We face losses every day. 
We all do. But how do we, how we react to them, how we speak about them, our reactions and our speech at those moments have a larger impact on those around us than when we are sitting on cloud nine and everything is going right. Leaders do not just talk the talk, they must walk the walk. We must lead those around us by our examples and if necessary, our words. It was St. Uh, August, Augustine, I believe, who said, Lord, let me, let me be a witness, and if I have to, give me the words to say. In other words, he wanted to be a witness by his life. And then if words were necessary, he relied on God to give them the right ones. Now, that quote may not be exact, so don't say I said it perfectly, okay? I know that. All right, does anybody have anything they want to add to this or say? We got through this quicker than I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking I was going to be rushed. <laughs> the, uh, the last one is a portion of Scripture that uh, we're very familiar with. Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1 through 3. I have too many things up here. And it says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vigilance, or vigil. Yeah, my, my tongue just doesn't want to work tonight, I'm sorry. Uh, of, of God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them the beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of faint heart, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So there are 12 different things that God has called us to do as leaders. The purpose of God's anointing. No matter what kind of leader we are, whether it's at home, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's at work, wherever you might be, God's anointing is on our life. And it is with this that we need to share with those around us. Number one, to the supernaturally, to supernaturally enable men and women to perform their ministry. Now, some will say, hey, that's, that's the pastor's job, to pick out the people that he needs to pick out so that they can do their job within the church. No, it's not with your kids to supernaturally help them find their call, their gifts, and allow them to use them in your home and with those around them. That's what 
That's another thing that it takes to help them grow. And as parents, as grandparents, it is our job to help them find that. Number two, to bring hope and good news to the afflicted. How many people do you know that are suffering? That are hurting? That could use just a little bit of good news? And I'm not just talking about the good news being the gospel. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's just reaching out to them and sitting there and listening while they pour their hearts out to you. That could be just as much good news to them as you sharing the gospel to them, but they're not ready for it. We need to be able to reach out and share the good news and share hope when people are afflicted. Number three, to heal the brokenhearted. What does brokenhearted mean? Anybody know? What's that? Being sad. Being sad. Okay. No hope. no hope. Okay. Depression, okay. To heal the brokenhearted. Now, if you remember and you go to, to Matthew chapter 5, and we see the, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm trying to get there quickly, and I apologize. We, we see the, in, in chapter 5, in, in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, we see, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, the earth. Blessed are those that are hungry and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are, are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are pre persecuted for the righteous, righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all, un, all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For, for so they shall persecute the prophets who were before you. I always think of brokenhearted as is, is this. In, in in two two different settings, okay? I, I agree with what everybody said. Depressed, sad. Um, I can't remember what the other one was. It, no hope. But I also think of it as brokenhearted spiritually in that they realize that what they have is nothing and giving to them something to hope for, giving them and leading them to Christ. Brokenhearted is not just a physical component that people endure or encounter. It's a spiritual set mindset to, or heart set too. Now, 
this is going to get off track just a little bit, and I apologize. But when Jesus was on the Mount of Gethsemane and he was praying over Israel and asking God to take away this burden, if I, you know, I don't want to die, please. If there's any other way, take it away. And then he was praying over you and I. And it says that he, his sweat was like blood. Then when he was hanging on the cross and they, and they stabbed him with the spear in the side and blood and water separated, flowed out of him, medically speaking, Jesus died, and, and I have the research where I looked this up. Jesus died of a broken heart over us. Those are all symptoms of being brokenhearted, sweating blood, the blood and water separating. That's all symptoms of the broken heart. Healing the broken heart was a healing that we received by Christ's death. Now, that may be a big tangent. That may be going a long ways out of the way. But I really think it's important for us to realize God's healing for our lives was more than just a checkbox. It's what he endured for you and me. Number four on the list, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Freedom. But you can't just say it. You got to give it. I can say, hey, you know, you're in shackles and chains. Hey, you're free. Be free. But you're still sitting in shackles and chains. You can't really give liberty without having an action to it. It's more than just words. It's our reaction and what we do to help people get out of that. Number five goes right along to set prisoners free. Number six, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Seven, to announce the day of God's vengeance. There we go. I got it. <laughs> and justice. Number eight, to comfort all who mourn. Nine, to furnish beauty for those who have lost it. Ten, to proclaim happiness and a glad heart. Eleven, to supply the opportunity to praise God's name. I find that one a little bit more difficult, at least for me. To give somebody the opportunity to praise God's name. And usually it's the one, the unlovely person from before. And I, if I'm the one beating them down even more, that's not an opportunity to praise God's name. The only opportunity that they might have is if I'm able to help lift them up. And number 12, to glorify the Lord and not man. As leaders, wherever that might be, however that might look in your life, it is important for us to always take God with us. We can't leave him behind. We can't leave him in the car 
when we walk into the office. We can't leave them at the doorstep when we walk into our home. One of the biggest leaders I've ever known in my life was my grandma. She was, she was this five foot nothing, maybe 100 pound lady who went out to the sawmill every day with my grandfather and worked alongside of him when I wasn't there. But when she came, and then she would come home and she'd make this fantastic meal for us. But her biggest leading was done at night. I can remember when I wasn't even close to God. And my grandma would take it literally when she would say, when the Bible says, go into your prayer closet, she would go into the closet. She also went and put my bed against that wall. And she would start praying. Now, my grandfather was hard of hearing because of the saw being right there. You know, he could snore away and it would never matter. But I could hear every word my grandma said and prayed over me, prayed over the, my nine cousins, my uncles, my aunts, prayed over their neighbors, prayed over everybody. That's where she led. She was very rarely would she come up to me and preach to me about getting right and getting my act together. She knew I heard her. She made it a point that I heard her. But you know, she led with a purpose. And her purpose was her family. And if even if that is our leading to lead our family, it's important that we take these examples and lead accordingly. We need to be the leader that God calls us to. And we need to take on that mantle every single day. Now, I'll be the first one to admit, I mess up. But I'll also be the first one to turn to the person I messed up with and quickly say I'm sorry. Because that's just as important. So before we end, does anybody have anything they want to add or share? And it gets really quiet in here. All right, we're going to end. I think usually we got about five more minutes so we could just kind of hang out here and you guys could talk, go back to before we started. But I want to pray. I want to pray over each and every one of us. Father, I thank you for the example of Isaiah. And I thank you for his willingness to respond to his encounter with you. And Father, we can look back through our lives and we can each see some of these encounters. But Father, more importantly, may we just not rely upon that one encounter, but may we have an encounter each and every day. As we go from this place, I just pray over each person here that we be leaders in our homes. That we be leaders around our neighborhood, in our jobs, with our extended family. Father, I just pray that you would help us find where we can lead and where we can touch other people. Father, I just pray right now 
may your spirit continue to pour into us and may we not tell you to stop. May it splash out, spill out, pour out on those around us that they may feel your presence and that they could be touched by your grace and your mercy. And we ask this all in your name. Amen.